a community with members that have become like family. Hi, I'm Jenny Lindsay. I I'm Jen Brown from Northeast Ohio. I'm Joel Slater from Hudson, Ohio. My name is Troy Lindsay. I'm from Northeast Ohio. I'm Olivia Byrne from Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm Dave Brown from Northeast Ohio, and I've been in Oswalk for about 10 years. Hi, I'm Ben Hamilton. I'm Jason Hamilton. Hi, I'm Jenny Hamilton. I'm Jason 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 I've been part of Lost Walk for about 15 years, and I collect anything and everything at the Lost Walk. I love Oz Walk for people. I love everybody that that comes to the meetings. I love everybody that comes to the social. Uh, it becomes more of a community rather really than just um, a bunch of people collecting toys. I'm kind of partial to Jawas right now. I, guess that's my <laughs> I jumped back into collecting a few years ago, working on a uh, men on card run. At the I like Oswalk because I've had a, um, an opportunity to meet folks from all over the state and beyond. Um, and I've met some really genuinely nice people uh, that have um, become really good friends. Favorite collectible is probably my final job. I enjoy the diversity of oh, um, what everyone collects <laughs> so that I don't have to buy everything myself. My favorite part of Oswalk is kind of the friendships and community, just uh, hanging out with friends. Really a great resource for collecting. Um, every time I'm in an uh, Oswalk meeting, I learn something new. It's a trap! few who made it into this panel, as you notice we had to cut the line off. Uh, if you find that you're on the other side of that problem at some point, we are actually recording these. They'll have them on YouTube later on, so we'll have all the panels recorded. And if you miss a star tot, you can also uh, pick up those on Monday afternoon after we're done with all the panels. We're going to give away all the extra star tots we got, and we'll go through and, and until we're run out. And we'll have extras of each one of them. So I want to make sure you, you know that so you don't have to be in all, 50, all 20 panels to get every single star tot. You could miss a few and fill in your collection. So what I want to do is introduce our next speakers and just jump right into it. This is a very exciting panel. I'm super psyched uh, to have these guests here. and. Uh, it's going to be a topic on how we go from concept model to actually a finished collectible uh, from the Kenner Star Wars toy line. And so we've got Jim Swearingen, formerly of Kenner, to, uh, who's going to be uh, discussing and interviewing this with uh, Chris Trogulius, who will be the interviewer. Thank you. Please welcome. Thank you. Whoa. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, like I said, I think you guys are going to appreciate this content. There's a lot of stuff in here, I'm sure, that you've never seen before. And I think it's presented in a way that it, it tells a great story, um, especially from the early concept development side. Um, as I said, my name is Chris Jorgulius. I've been involved with the collecting track for 20 years now. We've been, I've been to every single one, presented at most of them. And I'm um, happy to introduce um, Jim Swearingen here, my guest, former Kenner employee. And you guys know him from Plastic Galaxy. And <laughs> happy to be here and I know a few of you but I have to tell you up front that I'm uh, in awe of collectors because I am not one of you <laughs> but what little collection I do have is most of it came from collectors so I appreciate that so and I'm happy to be here it's great I've been having fun all, all week so far so, yeah. over the years we've been uh, tapping Jim as a resource, and, and he's come more into the fold in the past few years, and now that you've seen him on the screen, so it's, um, it's I'm very happy to, excited to have him with us. I'm sure how so many people have seen my mm -hmm. Those of you that haven't, should. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going Brian Stillman's Plastic Galaxy, yeah. all about Star Wars. Yeah. Yeah. Check that out. That was my start. <laughs> Jim's a celebrity, definitely. 
All right, let's get started here. I will tab through these things. I'll let Jim introduce himself, see a little period photography here. Yeah. Uh, I started when I was 27 uh, working on Star Wars. I, I was fortunate enough to be the first person to read the script from Lucasfilm and pushed it from there to where it is now, I guess. Uh, just uh, that picture next to, that you see is Jerry Springer. Uh, before he was a TV celebrity, he was mayor of Cincinnati. And on May the 4th of 1978-ish, he uh, was declaring it Star Wars Day in Cincinnati, and I was the one, along with that really frazzled Chewbacca, to present him with his 12 action figures. So, but it was a long time ago, and you can tell by the fashion of his... Uh, and that was the IG we built for the toy fair, not a real one. So, that little Easter egg I'll see here over Jerry Springer's shoulder, you see that building? That is the Union Terminal, and that's what Kenner uses the basis for the Hall of Justice playset mm -hmm. from the Superpowers line. You know, that's a real, it's, it's turned into a museum complex now in Cincinnati. So what we're doing here, concept models. This is the earliest in the earliest stages of 3D um, forms of, of the toys. And um, some of the things here that concept models are used for, you can see them on the screen, kit bash. You know, they're just really to show a, a design idea, just to get something down. This is things that the, the, the Jim and, and his team would, would, would whip up and just to show people just an idea. Sometimes, um, better than a sketch, sometimes you have a 3D form, you know, for presentation and photography and catalog photography and marketing purposes. A lot of these photos you'll see here, things were pulled out of catalog photography because back in the day, it was harder to update the photos. So they would send photo packet out, especially to overseas. Well, those guys would never get updated photos. So you'd open up a catalog and you see these concept models in there because it was, this was physically mailing negatives and, and photos back and forth. So in short lifespan, they didn't use these for very long. It was just a, a early stage to jump into, uh, relay the ideas there. And um, we're gonna be covering only the Star Wars line today. I could do a presentation for like three hours. We just didn't have the time I, <laughs> to cover the entire line. The, Kenner did so much development work. Um, it's a tribute to guys like Jim who, who, who did all this development. And um, we're lucky that these photos still exist. And some of these pieces still exist too, which is amazing. We'll start off here oh. with the earliest rendition here. Originally, Kenner was going to create nine figures. And you see all, all your basic... Uh, your heavyweights there, and these are um, hand-drawn concepts. This is 2D drawings. This is before and even a, a 3D model. And um, the, the photo below it, I've teamed up with that. That's from an in-house display, again, showing the nine core characters. And real crew drawings there, but um, enough to, to get the point across. And not that crew. So, okay. <laughs> not that crew. I'm sorry. It's not, it's not a slight on anybody, but they're not for the design of the figure. Those are the first. Those were originally a, a presentation board, and then cut up to make a 3D display. And the ones, the other photograph is the. Oh, not yet. Oh, we're not doing that. That's, that's the oh, slide. Sorry, he can see the next slide. I can see the next. <laughs> and you will see it's it. It's the confidence right now. So we jumped in. Um, some 3D formula. A lot of you people have seen these these concept models. Um, this is from the original, the nine, that correspond there. Um, this photo was dated May 10th, 77. So just only a couple of weeks before the movie came out. And Jim, do you want to talk about your experience seeing the film? Yeah, when we're going, we started all this work way before the movie came out. Uh, we read the script around January, February of 77. And all those drawings of the figures and stuff were based on black and white photographs. And these models were done uh, based on that same photo information. But the, when I read the script, I immediately thought we need to do the X-Wing and TIE Fighter. Because I thought that was the play value. And the, the way these ended up, and the reason that action figures are the way they are, the size that they were, is that I needed a scale that was practical from a price point. So, I went out in search of the action, the, fish, the uh, figures to do these on. And these are all sculpted at my desk <clears throat> with an X-Acto knife and body putty. 
So it's far cruder than the finished production stuff. But again, like Chris was saying, it was to get the concept across, sell it into management, and to sell it into 20th Century Fox and Lucasfilm. Because we were, we were selling everybody the idea of doing a movie property for uh, Star Wars. So, but these are, these are basically body putty and a lot of uh, exacto knife work. And then painted so when you get real close to them, they're not very clean. But it got the idea across, and these all show you the first, the very first lightsaber. Those are uh, that was a we'll monument. We got a closer look. Okay, we'll jump into. He's that. much more familiar with the slides. <laughs> <laughs> I can talk. I can talk a lot about all the little yeah. details. I, I know. I got. I got a flow going. I don't want to, to like like. <laughs> so anyway, those are the real rough models. Yeah. And that display came much later. Yeah. So, yeah. So. Just, um, We'll, uh, and you can see here, from C-3PO wasn't even ready at this point. He's still the cardboard cutout. And, um, and as Jim said, he sourced figures. He needed something of this scale. Well, I know the popular story is that Bernie Loomis, who was president of Kenner at the time, liked to say that they developed three and three quarter inch would be their scale. And they said, how big should the figures be? Well, that's because there was already figures that Jim found that fit in there that, that, that worked because there was a whole world developed by Fisher Price. Um, the adventure people and these guys started this action three and three quarter inch figure concept in 1975 and this is the the offerings then and they had ships and 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 five point of articulation action figures and Perfect for kit bashing. Perfect for kit bashing and we'll start here with Ben Mountain Climber Kenobi <laughs> 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 right, so he's one of the two guys in the set now. And, and Fisher Price is funny as, as I was going through finding all the restaurants. They these guys would just swap limbs and reshoot. So they developed us all this repaints, just like we're familiar with now. Um, it really just to save cost there. But you can see Jim took this figure here and did a little painting and a little vinyl, and you know the heads not changed. So it's it's a very it's a fantastic way that he was able to take this and turn it into a Ben Kenobi. You know, with, with, with in relatively short time to be able to show somebody a 3D action figure that would be for the Star Wars line. And um, carrying forth here, Princess Susan Organa from the Rescue <laughs> Team. Again, here's another one. That's uh, hardly any changes there. I didn't spend time putting buns on her. So. <laughs> she has a little belt that's pretty cute there, but yeah, just repaint. You can see the sleeves are still, everything's there. Just repaint that, that figure. But um, they didn't only look internally. Um, Jim was able to look internally. And it's funny, too, as his eyes are putting this together, Jim was, I was showing Jim him things he hadn't thought about in, in 35 years, so he didn't even remember some of these things. So it was, it was fun to kind of refresh his memory. But uh, like I said, he looked at, they looked internally at Kenner, and um, there were some things at Kenner here. And you can see uh, Chewbacca here is based on the um, dual launch drag race set that Kenner developed for the $6 million man line. And you can see how uh, <laughs> Bigfoot has been converted. Um, you know, break them apart, re-glue it, but you can see the legs. You can tell it's, um, it's the bionic Bigfoot figure there from that set. And there was a Steve Austin set, and, uh, a pair with, that they would race in the set. So really fun. Um, made the bandolier with wrap thread around to make it look like the cartridges. Um, I don't know where the gun came from. I didn't do that much digging into that part of it. But um, anyway, really fun to see that. Next celebration, you'll know where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> All right, made from various materials. You can see this is a good, this is a good array here where um, C-3PO's uh, hard paper, um, um, Jim mentioned the body putty. He means like Bondo, that you'd see uh, cars with, with the body. That's what they use. Um, that's what he was using. That's what he means by body putty. And then that's a modified, you know, another feature. All the Fisher Price figures had that, like the bell bottom pants, the bent leg. You can tell it's a Fisher Price figure. And um, the last one is uh, R2D2 completely kit bashed. And Jim says he had the model shop make this. Yeah, they might go down. Yeah, um, the model shop at Kenner in the basement. You give those guys um, some sketches and some direction, and they have you know the milling machines and equipment, and they're able to um, create things that uh, you know. They, I don't know how they came to the dome, but 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 I don't know if you can tell that the decals are peeling off. This is all hand applied, everything. This is just a very um, you know rough made, handmade model. And um, well, Pre Prelim had the premier model shop 
in the company. We had a group of about six or eight people that went through, and all they did was preliminary design development stuff. But they had, they had every kind of equipment and could do almost anything. If they couldn't do it, they'd find somebody that could. So. Yeah. And Jim worked with prelim design. But these guys take just get a rough concept here, and then they would turn it over to, to the like production design team who had to make it into a functional costed action figure. So Jim, you know, he was just really working on the concept side here, and uh, uh, like, like I said, the, the prelim team in their own model shop. And now we'll jump into uh, early lightsabers that Jim was alluding to here. Um, you see the, the, first, the first lightsaber was a monofilament line, like a fishing line, a little crank in its back, and you could pull the, pull the lightsaber out, wind it back in. Yeah, it, we, that was our first attempt. And this, would, this is what, where your turnover, these models actually show the turnovers sequence because we couldn't get a filament that would stay straight when it came out of the hilt. So we turned it over because it was their problem. Uh, but the modern filament is naturally made, it has a spiral when it's made. So when we turned it over, I think that Ben Kenobi was probably actually modified by the model shop because I think that shows the first telescoping uh, model, but it, they probably took our our original model and modified it just to show the concept in, in the production as a, as it was presented over and over again. So this kind of shows you how the process from uh, prelim to production, and then you know, obviously sculpture and stuff actually follows. Yeah, it's hard. It was hard for me to say. Jim couldn't remember it definitively. It looks like under his wrist there's a little a little tab that you pull it to show the retractable lightsaber, which eventually went to production. So, where are we going from here? We started at nine, and then we jumped to 11. We've added, there's C-3PO under, underlined in blue. He's, he, he went to 3D form. That's another modified Fisher Price that was a scuba diver. And then we've added two more. We've got a, a Jawa and a Tuscan Raider. Um, so rounding out, you know, filling out the line more. And, and from, from nine to 11, we jumped to 12. And at this point, we have the original nine are in more or less their final action figure form, and the three underlined here, the Jawa, Tuscan Raider, and the Death Squad Commander are still in concept form. And we can tell from the hands that the Tuscan Raider is uh, Fisher Price Adventure People. We can tell from the hands of the body shape that the Death Squad Commander is as well. And if you guys uh, remember from Toys That Made Us, um, Dave Okada took his brown sock and he made the cloak for that Jawa. <laughs> so, um, really interesting, and um, I will be getting more into these figures, uh, these last three here. Here's an in-house display, again showing those figures. Um, I want to highlight here that the Death Squad Commander in the graphic is the, the figure that you guys know, the human with, with, the, um, with the helmet, but you saw the figure before, sort of like the black stormtrooper looking guy. Well, those last three figures, this corresponded with how Mark Kenner released the figures. The, the, those three figures were the last three of the 12, and they even had, this is a store display showing that this is the last three, um, three new action figures. So this is late 79, and you see a good close up here. Um, I've never seen a photo that should, really shows the Tuscan Raiders face. Every, they must have glued the arms in that position, because all the photography that's been around has, has shown that. I'm hoping the gap is sticking in front of his face, but nice close up, closer view there um, of those three. And um, again, interesting death squad commander, right? So let's look into him a little bit more. So Jim's original stormtrooper there with, with the Bondo uh, putty head. And uh, you can see he's quite distinctly different from the, from the production figure. But you can see the, the Death Squad Commander there, definitely a black Stormtrooper, right? Larger helmet, it's not the original helmet, it's not the production version of the Stormtrooper helmet. But you can see the texture of the, the armor in his torso is his present, uh, the plates on his arm, but still has the, the bell bottoms from the Fisher Price. So he's a little mix up there. But then the last stage is so, okay, at, that, at this point, at this point, they did make a cardboard cutout of that Death Squad Commander, so they're leaning in the right place. So, we have this black Stormtrooper guy, and shown in photography here in this commercial with an early TIE Fighter concept model. So we have a black Stormtrooper in a TIE Fighter, 
he was a TIE fighter pilot. So Kenner originally was going to create a TIE fighter pilot in their line to fly the ship that Jim thought that they should have had, an X-Wing TIE fighter. So I thought that was a pretty amazing revelation there to, that they would see that. So the next step here, um, better sketches look more like the final figures. Um, you can see now that in-house, uh, that sketch from that in-house display where the, the, the human, humanoid disk squad commander now has, is realized. So they're all in pretty much their final form there and rounded out and that's your final 12, your original 12 action figures. Um, with the Death Squad Commander on the end, but maybe in the alternate galaxy we would have gotten this lineup. So Kenner eventually did that, and Jim doesn't know why that would change. He actually did that Death Squad Commander after you. Yeah, that was right. done in the production. Because once we turned the concept over, doing action figures, <clears throat> I was out of the action figure business because they didn't need me to, to do that beautiful sculpture. Someone else could do that, so... So let's see, that's the original 12, and then we jump to the next eight. Um, these, this photo is from a, a, a German catalog, like I mentioned before, the, the international photography usually is where we see some of these. Um, most of these figures you can see are in their final form. Um, the blue sniper piece is actually a very dark blue, um, and I'll get into more of these later. But definitely you can see, yeah, weird, you know, we have Death Squad, uh, the Death Star droid, and, and the Luke, again, is a, the Luke's, X-Wing is a Kenner, uh, sorry, a Fisher-Price figure, but Jim was very puzzled because at this point they should have been able to do that in-house as their own figure, so he didn't have an answer for why they use another Fisher-Price at this stage when they clearly had their own sculptures. Well, a closer look here, um, the Death Squad uh, sorry, the Death Star droid here is a kit bash. So you have C-3PO and then this praying mantis head from this AMT Gigantics. It's a, it was a, a diorama set. Put those two together and then a shot at the end of the final version of that figure. Um, like Jim was mentioned, the model shop probably made that power droid. Uh, that's all. It would have been probably made with styrene and, you know, in-house printed stickers. Um, so similar, but not but completely different, a little straight pointed up, the, the antenna. And R5-D4 was definitely an R2-D2 figure, and mm -hmm. the model shop would have come up with a way to make that cylindrical head, which eventually tapered in for production. And here's our Ben Kenobi model again. This is what they used for the, the Luke Skywalker figure. I don't know what the head was from. I, I cannot find that out. Barstan's a fun one. Everybody knows this guy, orange and blue. That it's like, where, where did this come from? Well, if, from the film, there you can see his his orange um, orange top and brown pants. And one of Jim's contemporaries, Steve Hodges, did this uh, in-house sketch here. There, the proposal for the Walrus Man action figure was that orange top with brown brown pants. And the next shot here is a closer up view of that that figure you saw earlier, orange and brown. I think one of the, the reason they took that out because the pants, the, the legs are three colors, you have orange, brown, and black. And to save money every time, they would be challenged with saving money on painting. So it's, uh, but I don't know why they took the, why they had the green instead of black. But you can see they were really close, but they missed the boat on this guy. So he turned, he would have been, I think he would have gotten a lot more street cred if he looked like that, that third photo there. <laughs> So Jim said he was out of action figures at that point, like in terms of the development, but then there was a new guy and Jim got involved. Yeah, this was, this is where I came back into action figures because Boba Fett was gonna be a top secret project. It, had, it came back into preliminary design so that we could, because we were in a key card area where you couldn't, people couldn't come and go. So uh, those, those photographs, were the turnarounds that I took when uh, Dave Okada and I went out to see the uh, the first costume. And people pointed out, this never made it to screen. This is one way early. And uh, people always got it. There's eyes painted on the helmet. So that's a really early one. And then I, I brought the photographs back and we took it to the next step. That's right. So that's George Lucas there. Jim, Jim took this photo. And that's his boss, Dave Okada. That's the guy with the sock. 
and they are here up at Skywalker um, checking out the new costume for the new bad guy. And so, and a lot of people know the early development side, Kit Bash Boba Fett. This is the very first 3D okay, representation. Probably the most, and we had uh, the Gus and, and, and Will and Matisse did a panel earlier on prototypes. They thought this probably was the most coveted prototype should it ever turn up. This guy made that figure. And um, <laughs> it's a. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So he, uh, he had a little help inside. So you can see here, he took the C3PO torso, the Death Squad commander legs, Stormtrooper arms. And um, that's the Raider Shogun Warrior from Mattel. He took that arm launch here and, and turned that into the backpack. It's, yeah, it, I charge a million dollars for it, so if anybody. <laughs> it was, it, that was, so we, it was really another exact knife project, carving a stormtrooper down to a boat set. Yeah, so here's a little, little, uh, Went through some revisions, just like any toy does. The very first version there, um, he would have that plastic cape, but you know, for cost reasons, they, they took that out immediately. Um, Jim mentioned um, uh, the, the, the eyes on the helmet. Uh, they simplified the design. They took the, the, even um, Lucasfilm did that too. There was eyes painted on the helmet. Um, you can see that third version there. Stripped it down a little more in terms of color. Um, they didn't change the, the, the first two photos are the same figure, it's just the color. The, the way these are color corrected, they, they don't match. And then the uh, fourth line up there, you can see where they changed the missile from the pointed missile. They used the, the, the back to that Mattel shaped missile. And that's the one you see on the card backs. And, and then the, contrasting that to the very end, the final version of Boba Fett. Um, you can see the very first versions where he did those lines painted on his boots, but that translated to sculpted lines in his boots. So they did what they can to in, in, this, in the sculpted form to add features that you wouldn't have to add later and save money when you can mold them right off the bat. And then uh, the famous launching, the, the launching mechanism there. Originally, like I said, from that, from that Shogun Warrior, you just push the button and, and it launches out. Eventually, I'm not gonna go through, we didn't, I'm not doing the development of Boba Fett here. Ultimately, it would come to that little J-slot shape in its back and pull it down and, and release the, the missile. Um, the missile, it was a terrible design, really from a toy standpoint. The missiles don't clip in like you'd expect. It just, it sits on top of this little um, cylinder inside and it sits on top of the spring. So when you launch it, as soon as you launch it, the missile just tumbles. So it wasn't cool like a Battlestar Galactica missile movie. So anyway, but we didn't get to see that at that point because because of Battlestar Galactica, they had a choking death, uh, unfortunately. and. Um, Right at the, right around Christmas uh, Christmas time in 1979, that happened, and because all the toy companies are, are you know in, in the safety uh, part of the um, consortium, and they they're they're, they're working on the Consumer Product Safety Commission, that feature was pulled from the Boba Fett. But Kenner was not to stop there. And that's the last 21 figures there. But then something else happened in 1978. Um, Whole thing called the holiday special. Hooray. So, um, kit bashing again. Um, this is all Chewbacca's family. You know, you have Itchy, his father, you know, Chewie, Mala, the wife, Lumpy, the son, and obviously the first three are just modified Chewbacca figures. <laughs> when these first turned up in the mid 90s, I was highly skeptical that these were legit. Well, later on from Lucasfilm, that, that, that file photo turned up that was a Kenner file photo. So those were on display um, for internal proposal. Um, obviously, it went nowhere. He's a terrible representation of, of Itchy. <laughs> Molly is kind of, anyway, a little sketchy. <laughs> but uh, you can see uh, Lumpy there. He's got what? He's got the little bent arm and a slightly bent leg. But what does that mean? Fisher Price to the rescue again. Here's little Johnny from the Wild Animal Safari. Hey. <laughs> tortured that poor figure to get it to look like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got the one of those. <laughs> okay, you need the cage to complete your set. Now you, now you have a better reason to get it because of the Star Wars tie-in. You never thought it'd be cool. Still not cool, but it's cooler. <laughs> Alright, let's see. We jump past 
still tied to action figures. Um, this was an in-house display. I mean, you see cardboard display with the, the, the action figures have been on there. Um, graphics on the front panel. Um, I'm pretty sure that this, at least in somebody's head, it's like, hey, we could do something with this and turn that into the early bird because it's very, it's so similar to the early bird backdrop. And uh, getting more more stand. That photo you saw in the first photo was as it was a zoomed in of this version. So that was a mock up of the action stand. You can see the little levers, which to me I think it looked like popsicle sticks because I don't think this was articulated. There's no there's no spinning discs on this. And uh, then the backdrop. Um, they use that multi part backdrop later on in the Empire Strikes Back with the with the display arena. And you know, ultimately, that turned into the first mail-in Star Wars mail-in premium, which was the action display stand. So really neat to see that at that nine-figure stage, they had this action figure display stand um, in their in their minds. One more concept in here. Early, everybody knows the blue snaggletooth it was first available in the Cante uh, Canteen Adventure set, and here's that set. The set is exactly the same. Um, with three characters here, and Jim, I think, knows who drew these guys. Uh, for sure. Well, I know I did the uh, burrito and the hamburger, and I think that, that uh, I may have drawn that on. But again, we went back to the style that we were using before. Yeah. We, we're getting more and more, as this all happened after the movie, before all those other figures. So after the movie, we got more feedback from Lucas, and they took more pictures for us. Because yeah, Lucas was very, Jim and them struggled. I mean, they, they took photos, you guys have seen in, 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 the, in the film versions um, and the shows that Jim's have been in. They take, shoot photographs of the movie screen because that's that's how they were getting their references from Lucasfilm. So it was very um, they DIY almost there on the Kenner side. But at this point, there was no blue snaggle teeth in that set. Interesting blue boots on Walrus Man, though, that they mm. slipped there. And, uh, and then the Creature Cantina set, you can see the first version here. You, you, that's been on, um, that's on the, the back of the earlier Kenner cards on the 21 backs, the 20 backs. And it's a completely different base, that'd be a vacuum form base, but it had all the elements there. It had the bar, the cardboard backdrop, the doors that swing open. Those doors are blue, um, but look closely here. There's our dark blue snaggletooth and our orange walrus man. They made it to this, um, this photo session. And the next photograph here is uh, of the uh, cantina. I like to plug rebelscum.com. I stole all these blue background photos. Dave Myatt shot these for their archives, and they're very handy um, to have these for uh, comparison purposes. And uh, Land of the Jawas went through the same thing there. Cardboard backdrop. You had your pod. Um, a plastic base with action levers, but all completely redone. You can see that pod is a very plain Jane. Um, but look closely. There's the other two more figures from that that original photography shoot there, that early concept, Power Droid and R5 to be a droid factory. All the elements there again, the idea of a crane, a multiple parts that in, in their base where the, where the parts fit, um, all completely um, handmade model here. This would be the white styrene material, the painted brown, you can see from the edges where it's um, scuffed a little bit. So really, really fun stuff to see and um, that, that, that the guys were using like found parts in, in a set like this and just to put the idea together, you know, and they would use stuff like model kits and yeah, lots of model kits, set, you know, spaceships and airplanes, they all got sacrificed to, for these things. All right. And here's one I don't think you've seen, unless you've been online for a long time and you remember this back when they popped up on StarWars.com. The Death Star Space Station, Jim helped make the one on the left is the model that we built in prelim, and that's all. the The cannon on the top is a kit bash. There's a whole bunch of different parts. Can't you know? Probably Second World War cannons and some uh, spaceship parts from uh, from NASA. So it was we constructed that way. That the the, uh, the desk in the middle that was all done with vacuum form parts by the model shop. The, the, uh, not exactly, parts of the, that original uh, trash compactor are from some Play-Doh stuff that we did. And I think uh, part of it was too from a, a product that we had called Play Stone. 
but the I know the crank is from an extruder. So, but we would use all kinds of things just to put these things together, and then it was again turned over to production design, and where all the kinks were uh, taken out of it, and the uh, production models next to it. So, but yeah. it is just a process of putting it all, you know, kit bashing and model shop work. That's right. You got eagle eyes. If you can see um, that little the, the trash compactor monster sticking his head out in there. Um, it's only three levels, but the all the all the all the basics are there. The cardboard inserts and everything. But you can see, but it tur they turned it over for for the production designers and those guys that made it. Four levels. They integrated the trash compactor. So really, as cool as the concept model is, they really took it to the next step when they finally released the toy. So um, kudos, and that's a great place. That there's so many features packed into that one one thing. All these elements from the film that they captured in this one toy. It's, Probably one of the, the favorite places. It was mm -hmm. designed specifically when we designed it. It was designed as pie wedges so that you could put a, you could continue the circle. So it was intentional that it was shaped like that. I've never actually seen it that put that many stuff together. Yeah. I, can see, I think it takes like 16 or something to do that. So kids wouldn't have done it. But now that you can buy beater sets, you can. I've seen a couple of different guys that do it. But I think it's like. Six, it's, it's, it's an insane amount. It's, it's, a, it's less of a wedge than you think. You think you put four together and it'd be a circle, but the idea was there to make a round desk stuff, but really, really fun thing. And uh, a little early version of the patrol do back here. Um, you see where they, uh, you know, sculpted the legs uh, into uh, the saddle so it looked like the stormtrooper were straddling it. <laughs> uh, right? Yeah. But that, that was a practical solution that we had to come up with because we had straight-legged figures, we had to find a way to put them in a, on the do-back, so the trap door was where that happened. And that this continued on to the tauntaun, you know, but it was a way to get stiff-legged, non-articulated figure hips to put them on a do-back or a tauntaun. Yeah, so Jim came up with the trap door idea, and this, this is a late 79, he had, he had gone to visit the set Empire Strikes Back to see the taunts on. He got the idea of doing that. So about the time this was being developed, they were still developing Empire Strikes Back. So and the taunt had the same feature in there. So pretty pretty cool. And oh, the other thing in this, the the do back's head here would have gone up and down versus side to side. Um, so for play value, the, the swinging the tail and making the head go side to side is a, a natural combination versus the up and down motion. So pretty neat, but it's, it's amazing. This has never, this physical model has never been, never surfaced. And then we jump into uh, the early X-Wing fighter model that Jim alluded to. Yeah, this this is based on the snapshot that we got, which was a three by four snapshot of the X-Wing. So the proportions weren't real clear from the snapshots, but these are, the X the X wing concept was developed in prelim, and the, the lights and sounds putting LED on the front, which was pretty high tech for 1977. And then uh, everybody asked about the buttons; they're from Radio Shack. <laughs> but again, this is getting the concept across. We didn't have to worry about how you'd integrate it. We just needed to present it to the to our management and 20th Century and Lucas. So we got the idea across and then once it went to preliminary design, or went from preliminary to production, that's when all the refinements got done. And this was done after the movie. I mean, the, the, the prelim model came before the movie, but the production stuff started after the movie. So we, by then, were getting photography that we needed from Lucasfilm. So it made it much easier, because they weren't prepared up front to have the front side, top, bottom, all the views that we needed. They just had snapshots off the set, so that's why our proportions changed. And also, we're fighting price point. That's why this one's a little stubbier than the one they're making now. Is that we were this cost fifteen fifteen ninety nine retail, so we were fighting prices. The last one I bought was fifty seven dollar. <laughs> so you guys can see there's two two buttons in the back, one for the sound, one for the light. But it has all the elements there. The X-wings fold out. The R2 dome is in there. The canopy that moves. Um, so, except for the little stunted wings, it's, it's pretty much all there. And this would have been made in the model shop, you know, out of styrene board and uh, and other parts. And, uh, going along with that, the Tie Fighter you guys saw earlier. This is um, on the back of the, and that X-wing before 
and the TIE Fighter were translated for the fold back card back. If you ever look at those, the kind of off, the TIE Fighter looks a little different. It's, from, it's a photo of this model. Uh, again, a styrene model, very plain here, no panel um, um, accents to, to give it some color. And you know, he dressed it up, give it a little bit more uh, industrial look. And um, certainly when you add the, the, the decals to the panels, it, it definitely uh, improves it. And the uh, octagon of the, uh, the, uh, the clear canopy there, I mean the, uh, the, sh the, the windshield. Right. No wind in space. Um, <laughs> So we jump into the land speeder. You can look at this guy. He's pretty fancy. The paint job there it looks, mm. looks a little bit more like Luke's land speeder. Um, <laughs> would it cost reduced this morning to, to, to produce the final toy? A really cool piece to see. And um, and like for Jim's purposes, just to get the idea across, you just throw a remote control next to it. You say, hey, we're going to do a remote control version. <laughs> oh. It's the same one. So. Um, Ultimately, this was the um, you know, the sonic land speeder. So you click that remote, and, and, the, and the, the sound would activate the steering of that. Let me release it, JC Penny. Um, a higher price point. Uh, one of the rare Star Wars toys to from, the, from, from that time period. And then bringing Darth Vader's Tie Fighter into the fold here, he gets his little shot. You can see uh, the little white around the canopy. They just took. Uh, a white TIE fighter and painted it gray and uh, made some new wings out of styrene. It's all flat sheet. There's there's no um, cross hatching or anything like that. And this guy changed quite a bit here. It's an original model for the sand crawler. Uh, obviously, those are tank treads. But all, uh, a lot of the wheels in there, things like that, were highly detailed. They were never going to go to the final model, but this gets the idea across. You can see that. The, Little antenna sticking off the back of that thing. So the, the form was mostly there. They, they changed it a little bit, but really interesting to see. And this is a, again a, this has been a, a white styrene model that was painted, um, painted brown. So very fun stuff. Early version of the Little Falcon. And the guy who made this is still with Hanbro. Mark Rudeau is still designing the Millennium Falcons. This first one was done in foam core. It was a beautiful foam core model. And then it went through, then they went further going on the styrene. But uh, yeah, this is he's had his hands on I think almost maybe not all of them, but most of the uh, Millennium Falcons that have been done over the last forty years. And he's still doing that. Still doing it. Started as an intern yeah. working for these guys. Now he's the head honcho on the design side for Hasbro. Yeah, this guy's pretty wicked. Oh. Imperial Troop Transport, the early, <laughs> early concept of this very angular design. Uh, it's got a, uh, an X Wing engine pod on the top. Looks like a robot. Um, the engine pod's actually where the battery went. It's a C, C sized battery, would have fit in there in yeah. the top of the pod. The, the pod was split in half to put the battery in there. Um, and this is mentioned in. I think it's Plastic Galaxy. He talked to Tom Troy, the designer of this. He envisioned a sort of imperial droid that went in. So you could see that droid in the front of that um, cargo hold. And he basically took an R2D2 figure. He had to cut the feet in half. You can see the feet have been chopped down because it wasn't, it was too tall to fit in his model. Um, that that droid, that, that black droid, R2 still exists. But, Never seen um, evidence of the 3D form of that troop transporter existing, but that'd be another one that was all um, sheets, sheet styrene painting and, and expertly made by the model shop. And so that's a gorgeous piece. And there's lots of model yeah. detail on it. Yeah, it's much cooler like, than what ended up in production. So uh, Tom was in the prelim group, and that's what he turned over, and then it was. Probably cost reduced for some reason, maybe it's shorter, more compact, or maybe Lucasfilm had their influence on it. Yeah, I think this made its. Uh, this is back into the toy fold the last few years as a toy. Um, I think it was in Rebels, right? Yeah. And jumping in out of the action figure vehicles into the die cast line, you can see some two early versions mm -hmm. here of the. And not two, but one each of the, the Tie Fighter and the X Wing. And that Tie Fighter, I should have taken a picture. It looks like the Colin Cantwell sort of reminds me of that of the original models that, that, were, that, that Lucasfilm um, helped develop for the for the movie side. But just 
interesting to see you know the, the early versions and, and how they transform to the, the final version. And again, uh, expanding that line, the rest of the diecast vehicles. If you look really closely, the, the Millennium Falcon is is a uh, again made of styrene. This is, and I don't know what the scale of these are. They take when you take a photo like this, you can't tell exactly how big these pieces are. Uh, it's possible it was one to one, but um, pretty neat to see that somebody sat and hand made that. Possibly Mark. We don't know for sure. We can see the differences there, how it went from concept to final form. And then now we got the die cast. What's left? We got a little 12 inch action figure oh, action here. We got uh, early concept of Luke and Leia. And uh, all the basics are there all the, the hair, the styled hair, the, the the belt, the outfit, and Luke's belt, the grappling hook, it's all there. I do not know what figures those are. Those are existing dolls. It looks like Marie Osmond. So Luke and Leia, we jump in. Back to, back to Six Million Dollar Man. Use the uh, bionic Bigfoot there to uh, mock up a Chewbacca. So pretty cool there. And then sticking with more TV toys. We took the Hardy oh. Boys, Parker Stevenson, gave him an outfit, shots of photos, and he's a really confident Han Solo right there. <laughs> Nancy Drew was definitely going to love it if he showed up in that outfit. So he, uh, and you can see the basics again there, the metal, the, 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 uh, the vest, all the clothing, everything trans translated over. Because it was easier, they, they could have made uh, their sewing department would have been able to whip up an outfit way faster than you could tool up a new head. So and you had these pieces already in existence. So why stop at Han Solo? Throw a little bit of uh, <laughs> body putty in there, give him a disguise, and turn him into Ben Kenobi. So um, this robe still exists. It's like a burlap cloth with a belt, like a, like a monk's tunic almost. Uh, this is from a French catalog. Of this photo, so it's pretty fun to see see that you know that, that they would they would go to that level. But is it, you can see it, just to get some idea that you're going to have a Ben Kenobi figure, it would be there. So once you've been Han Solo, once you've been Ben Kenobi, as long as you don't have any aspirations to be a politician, you might pull this one off. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he never denied being in this outfit here, but you can see this first version <laughs> of Lando. Same guy here. Yeah, so, um, but uh, awesome to see, right? And then eventually they did create a really nice likeness of Billy B. Williams, but this Lando Calrissian 12 inch was never released by Kenner. Um, there are a couple of prototypes of that around, but. It would be fun to see the progression there. And that's what's the fun thing about these concept models, is they would do things like this. And it's a, there's a lot of aha moments. If you're looking through some random photography, you know, in the 90s when we get some of these catalogs, you'd see these things for the very first time, just like you're seeing though. I and mean, I had that aha moment, and lots of collecting the uh, friends here had the same things as we were researching these over the years. And uh, another guy here, we we're working for 12 inch figures. Joe Johnson gave these two. Yeah, these are these are the first. These are Joe Johnson's concepts for features for the strong or for a Boba Fett. So they gave us a. I think there were twelve altogether, but they're uh, this nineteen seventy eight ish. The uh, Lucasfilm was one of the first companies to have a color photocopier. So these are. The ones that I got are photocopies of the original the, the original watercolors we did. So, but we use these as references, things we could do with Boba Fett. Yeah, showing all the features there, and you know, Joe was the designer of Boba Fett. And for those of you who don't know, maybe the Boba Fett was envisioned as initially as a super trooper, like a, like an elite stormtrooper. So the very first versions of this is completely white. You guys have probably seen that they've made action figure versions of that since then, but translating these drawings into figure form, we have uh, that Boba Fett. You can see a lot of the similarities, the shapes of the helmets as, as in the drawings. 
That's Gary Kurtz, and he's holding a remote. There's a wire going from that remote to the Boba Fett. This is an electronic Boba mm -hmm. Fett. A um, little stunted missile in his backpack. And um, basically, they, for photography, they just took that took that electronic version out, just shot it without that as like, okay, we're gonna just have a regular action figure. And then you can see the final version. So the changes they made between their concept and their final version. Uh, pretty, pretty interesting there. And then moving along to some of the other guys. Here's a concept. Originally, to project your Princess Leia hologram, um, Jim and his, his team thought we could do a projector here. We put a give a show projector in the in the chest of the uh, for R two D two, and that was cost reduced out of the original the eventual remote control unit. But it had lights and the, a lot more features than they ever put in production. Yeah. So and then they sort of tweaked it to be this version here. Well, they took took the give a show out, um, and they just made it just the standard remote control. Except there's something a little bit more special about that because he's not as small as you think he is. On the side there, that's the that's on, on the uh, on the left side. That's the production version of that, that R2, uh, radio controlled R two D two, which is about this tall. So that other model is like this big. Uh, the big model did turn up about ten or fifteen years ago, so that still exists. Um, interesting. Beside it, um, uh, a concept model of what would have been that scale. Uh, it looks like it mostly styrene. The legs are like styrene uh, sheet The with the controller, with that red controller. Uh, one of those red controllers surfaced recently. It was all painted black, so you could turn it up. Uh, you could look on the inside, it was red, and, and it's pretty interesting that they that was still around, and that red came from this original molded design. So interesting how, how it went from a that bigger to give a show to the smaller cost reduced form of this figure. In the UK. Uh, getting into the plush guys, Chewbacca. Oh my god. Quite <laughs> fun there. Very similar to their final version, especially R2. Um, but, you know, everything went through its uh, concept stage. A little development of the lightsabers here. Okay. Inflatable lightsaber was the first version that Kenner released. Um, you can see the very top version, you know, the goofy orange blade, but it looks like Darth Vader, but the hilt, look at the hilt, it's got all that detail. It's like a, a lightsaber that you'd see sort of nowadays, and then they move that down to sort of really cost reduce that to basically that flashlight on that big fat tube, and then they <laughs> change it to a little bit more with a decal and sort of have a blend between the first one and the second one to get your final version. And, uh, and this toy is funny, this came in a little patch kit, little pieces of, of squares of tape. This is when you punctured your lightsaber, you just put the tape in the hole. <laughs> Bopped your brother over the head. <laughs> Early version of the three position laser rifle. And the uh, laser pistol here, Han's laser pistol. This turned up only a few years ago. This is a, a Mauser. This is made in Hong Kong. It's from some toy. That we haven't identified what toy that is right now, but they made a scope in the model shop and uh, the muzzle uh, to fit onto that, that existing toy. And then you can see the bottom photos. That's, that's what the final version looked like of that toy. And expanding the lines here in the Play-Doh. This is a, a good shot of you know just taking the drawing and drawing all the elements to show a Play-Doh set, showing we'll have three cans of Play-Doh, we'll have an X-Wing, here's a knife, here's the three molds, and, and, and it'll have a play mat. So just relaying what the final intention was for that set. And, uh, this, was in a, this was in the catalog as well. And real early version here of the electronic battle game. This is, you see all the electronics. This has been like the kind of like breadboarding. You develop the electronics. You're not trying, you're not trying to package it at that point. You're trying to prove out like how the gameplay works uh, in a, um, a styrene, uh, probably a back form styrene base. And the X-Wing Aces used to be one of the coveted pieces in the 90s to get from the vintage line. This was a very, very all mechanical, it was a, based on there, Kenner developed this Aerial Aces game, this World War II uh, shooting game, and it had a, like, 
string, like, like cables on the inside as you move the, the cannon around. The cables would move lights in the back. It was a very complicated mechanical toy. The boxes got little stickers that says do not drop because they had a lot of problems with keeping this thing uh, going. But you can see it's all they did was shoot it in gray and, and it still got the, uh, the cartridge from the, from the, the shells on top. So it's Nobody wants these nowadays, unfortunately. But it's a pretty cool idea. It's a very big tabletop game, so it's pretty fun there. And then the early concept. This is mostly packaging. The movie viewer for Kenner had been around for quite a while. They'd done Snoopy and other other things, and they just translated it right to Star Wars, and it was it was perfect for Star Wars. It's such a visual medium. You can see it's mocked up the boxes. It's got the original Star Wars logo, pointy W. And these guys you see, Star Tots, I don't know how many of you guys have known, we've been doing Star Tots since uh, Celebration 6 was the first one. This is the fifth series of Star Tots we've done. We got Star Tots idea from Kenner. They developed um, four, four, actual, four actual figures, but they had created eight. Um, this was based off of their Tree Tot toy line. Uh, a preschool line is very rudimentary. The figures were one and three quarter inches tall. Our Star Talks are one and three quarter inches tall. We started our original set with these eight and we, we made eight more. Um, most of those, pretty much all those are designed by Jeff Carell. Um, Matthias Rendon did a, a number of those as well too. And now Jason Pell's doing the artwork. So we, we took this idea that Kenner had and really ran with it for us. And it's been really fun and seems like a lot of people like these. And, this is where it came from. It was this this concept. It never went anywhere with Kenner, but I think we've done the, some real justice here and we brought it forth. And, and that rounds us out here. And, uh, I don't think we're quite, we'll, we have some time for questions if you guys want to answer some questions. We have seven minutes or if you want or if you just guys want to head out um i'm willing to we got one in the back is there anything that you designed anything that kenner designed or that jim designed that he wishes kenner did produce uh i get that asked asked a lot we did so many products the idea things that never got done we did a death star game that i kind of could have, I thought could have been kind of cool. It was a, a game with a Death Star that spun around and you have the X-wings on springs that you could fire at the target and they would blow up. That's about the only one. But we, we did an awful lot of stuff that was just pure concept and never got made. And we were talking about 77, we didn't have any electronics, so we were all, everything was mechanical. The X-Wing. The X-Wing and TIE Fighter. The, the, from the moment I read the script, that's what I wanted to play with. You know, I, would, I was 27, but I, you know, when you're a toy designer, you think, you know, I take 20 years away and say what my, my seven-year-old self want to do. And that, I, as soon as I read they were doing dog fights and they are chasing each other, it was like, that's automatically, that's what I was going to do. So. Thanks, guys. We're going to take questions in the, in the social media, too. Thank you, sir, for that unsolicited testimony.